My name is Dan Smith, and I am UN Watch's New York associate. Uh, UN Watch is based in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, where much of our work is focused around monitoring uh, the UN Human Rights Council and um, and ensuring uh, that the alarm is is uh, is sounded when human rights abusers are elected to the Human Rights Council. Uh, so we n now have a presence here in New York, which is new, and one of our jobs here. Uh, will be to similarly sound the alarm um, when, uh, for instance, at the Commission on the Status of Women, uh, abusers of women's rights are elected to the Commission. Um, last April, uh, we publicized uh, when Saudi Arabia was elected to the Commission. Uh, they will take their seat once the Commission, uh, comm this Commission finishes on Friday, this session of the Commission. Um, and uh, another current member, um, of that commission is Iran, uh, where you'll be hearing today um, uh, from the former Minister of Women's Affairs in Iran, Ms. Manaz Afkam Afkami. Um, so with that, uh, we thank you all very much for arriving. I see our panelists are now here, and uh, we will get started in just one minute um, with the great Professor Erwin Kotler to introduce. Thank you. Let me just ask the uh, panelists if they would just take their seats up here. And then, you stay okay, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all to what is a real gathering of not only women human rights defenders, but real heroes of human rights who have put themselves on the line in the struggle for human rights and women's rights in their respective countries, which regrettably are countries of oppression and where their struggle is so singular on behalf of the welfare of the people in their respective countries and as part of the larger welfare of the human condition. They've each demonstrated how one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can confront evil and thereby transform history. Now that is also uh, the motto of the Rao Wallenberg Center for Human Rights which is co-sponsoring the event with UN Watch, and you've heard from uh, Dan Smith, where Rao Wallenberg is Canada's first honorary citizen. He's also an honorary citizen of the United States. And where that motto was that which the Canadian Parliament characterized him as, as being a person who demonstrated, uniquely so, that someone with the compassion to care and the courage to act can confront evil prevail and transform history. One of the pursuit of justice themes of our Rao Wallenberg Center is the theme of empowering women, empowering humanity. And therefore, the struggle for women's rights is really a struggle with respect to the welfare of humanity as a whole. And as I said, we have here four courageous women from four countries of oppression. I've had some experience with uh, each of those uh, countries defending uh, political prisoners respectively in them. And what I'm going to do now is just introduce them in the order in which uh, they will be speaking and then uh, let them uh, proceed. The first speaker today will be Kiri Nivyabandi. She is a leading Burundian activist, a person who has been at the forefront of the struggle for human rights uh, in Burundi. We recently held a 
conference uh, in Canada, in Ottawa, with regard to the situation in uh, Burundi. As a matter of fact, Kerry is now, and we have been the beneficiaries in a sense of uh, her activism, uh, which caused her to have to flee Burundi and come to Canada, where she works with the uh, Nobel uh, Women's Initiative, a great human rights and democracy leader. And as you know, Kerry, we recently were uh, had the benefit of having a great human rights hero in Burundi, known as the Mandela of Burundi, Pierre Clavier Mbonmanika, who to visit Canada. Uh, he addressed our Raoul Wallenberg All-Party Parliamentary Caucus on Human Rights. Burundi is one of the countries at the forefront of our involvement, and I'm delighted to introduce uh, Kerry to you and have her share uh, her experiences and her engagement with us. Thank you. Um, it's well. Hello. Thank you all for for coming, and it's wonderful to have a full room. Um, and I see a number of my African sisters, so that's uh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Hello. And thank you, um, yes, thank you, uh, Professor Kotler and uh, the Raoul Wallenberg Center uh, for this opportunity really to, um, for, for, for those of us who are women and who happen to be struggling for the respect of human rights um, globally. All right. This can go up. Um, yes, I hope this is better. Yeah, I think I'll hold it. Um, uh, that's better, right? Okay. <laughs> I see everyone nodding. Um, I, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the situation in Burundi, and so perhaps uh, I'll start with giving you a brief overview of what is happening, because I think it is fundamental for, um, for all of us to connect our struggles and to be well informed about what is happen happening around the world. And, uh, and to take it um, personally. Uh, I like to say that I take injustice personally, and I hope by the time we leave, you'll all take the injustices happening in my country, Burundi, very personally. Um, uh, Burundi is a, is a small, landlocked, very beautiful, the most beautiful country in the world, I would say, a uh, country in Central, uh, Central Africa, and we have had decades of uh, what they what is often uh, termed as uh, ethnic conflict, but in fact it is um, usually it's political conflict that, that's um, utilizing ethnicity uh, as, a, as a way to fund, uh, to find the conflict itself. And so finally we had, uh, we had a civil war in the 90s and we finally came to an agreement and uh, we're beginning to have some degree of democracy and we had a president who was elected uh, who had been a former rebel, but who was elected and who, was, um, who now took office and ran for 10 years. In those 10 years, a lot of human rights um, abuses were occurring, um, but at the same time, the media was still free, the opposition parties had some degree of, of, of freedom and freedom of expression, and so, um, it was not, it was not a just society, but there was some, there was ability to dissent and there was an ability to contradict what was happening. Now in 2015, which is when I became a refugee, what happened is our head of state had been in, uh, in, in power for uh, two consecutive terms, presidential terms, and he decided to run for a third uh, term in office, which is, um, a violation of our constitution, which goes uh, clearly for two terms uh, in office. And so he was presented, was put forward by his party as the lead candidate. As a result, um, civilians took to the streets and began to protest very peacefully, but to protest what was um, clearly a violation of not only our constitution, but the peace agreements that we had 10 years earlier and which really cemented uh, democracy and rule of law. 
And in, in, in what, what happened is a very, very interesting, and it is something that we are witnessing across uh, the continent and something that I see happening around the world, the rise of authoritarian regimes. What happened is uh, once uh, people started protesting peacefully, the police, of course, under the... Um, under the authorization uh, of the uh, leading of the authorities and the president, began to tr to brutalize uh, protesters, to arrest people, to kill them, to torture them, anyone who had been to the streets, and and, and so this became uh, a clear repression of freedom of expression, and that's where I, as a citizen, I was not a member of any um, human rights organization, of any specific movement, I really was an individual, as Professor Kotler was, was saying earlier, an individual outraged by the injustices happening in my country. So I, I took that personally. And, um, and, I, and what, I, what happened is that I noticed very quickly that protesters, as, or as very often, especially in, in in certain African countries were young men. We didn't see women in the streets. We saw young men from, um, from neighborhoods that we, you would consider to be disadvantaged. And I didn't see people like myself. I didn't see women. I didn't see working class women. I didn't see the educated elite, although everyone was complaining about what was happening, but no one had the courage to actually uh, you know, leave the comfort of their homes and the stability of their jobs and to go and um, join these protesters uh, in, in the streets. So what, what, what I did was I raised awareness among friends and others and used the power of social media to mobilize women to come and, and protest in the streets of, uh, of Burundi, protest against the violation of our constitution. And this is something that was very really unusual because in Burundi women are really take a back seat. You're not, actually tradition says a, a woman should not be speaking in public. She's spoken for, she never speaks herself. So even this is a, is a violation of our tradition. Um, and, so, and, and so for the first time we were able to organize women only protests, peaceful protests in, in, the, in the country. And, and these were very successful because we were able to get to the center of the city where most other protesters had not been able to reach. We organized in a, in, you know, through word of mouth, and we were able to, uh, you know, to to bypass the police roadblocks and, and protest. We were met brutally by 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 the police. We were tear gassed. We were, you know, beaten. Some women were beaten. Women fainted. Uh, actually, as we were protesting, but we resisted. We didn't run away. We did, we resisted and resisted. And, uh, and, and, and this was truly, um, it was really a revolutionary moment in the sense that first women for the first time, many of these women came without their husband's authorization. They came, um, you know, hiding this from, from other members of their family, but they really had, um, thank you. They had, they, they felt, I, mean, I think what this means is that people, especially women, are very political. We often like to say, uh, oh, um, you know, the, the women in our country, we don't see them at, at, at this and this position. They are not, they are not, they don't seem to be that interested in politics. At least that was the rhetoric in Burundi, which is completely wrong. When, they are, when an opportunity presents them, uh, itself, you know, they, ma we manifested in ways that were far more powerful than what our, our, our fellow men were doing. And as a result of that, um, we became a threat uh, to, to, the, to the ruling party. And shortly after we had, uh, there was a coup d'etat that happened and, and it was failed and it was used as an argument to repress uh, any voice really that had stood up to, to the regime. And, and as a result of that, um, many of us had to go into hiding we were threatened, we were we received phone calls, we were, we, we were threatened at so many levels. A number of the women that I was with, sadly, um, were arrested, were uh, thrown in prison, they have been tortured. One of the women that I walked with, um, that I hugged, you know, during this protest has been was raped, um, really gang raped to death. She was raped in three different locations. Um, because 
the way the state operates is that once a person is arrested, we have the all-powerful intelligence services, which I'm sure everyone who comes from an oppressive country is very familiar with. And you have these uh, detention centers which are unofficial. Uh, so you, you're not taken to jail, you're taken to these um, intelligence service, uh, which could be a house, in, uh, you know, a deserted house in, 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 in an obscure neighborhood. It could be, so it, it, it's within the community, but you don't, you, you're not always, um, it, it's difficult to document um, um, such, uh, such things. And so she was taken to three of these centers, to, uh, spaces, and gang raped by the youth of the, um, of the ruling party. They have a militia called Mbonera Kure who are ruthless in violating human rights. She has since died. We don't even know where her body is. It's claimed that, according to some witnesses, that her body was thrown uh, you know, behind one of the bushes. This is the fate of uh, anyone who stands up to the regime in Burundi today. So as a result, many of us are today are in exile. 90% of the private media, we had an extraordinary, vibrant um, uh, media and very independent, that was holding government to account. 90% of those journalists are outside of the country today. Uh, all the opposition parties and all the opposition leaders are outside of the country. All uh, intellectuals and leading uh, thought leaders of the country have been um, are now into exile. So uh, that crackdown has been so severe that it managed to um, expel basically any dissenting voice from the country. And now what's happening is today that if you, it's, Burundi is no longer in the news because it seems as though things have calmed down. But in reality what has happened is um, uh, everyone who speaks otherwise is out of the country and those who are inside are live in a state of such terror, of such fear that they are unable to to say anything. It's it's so uh, it's so deep that even if my being here today uh, is posted on social media, many of the people who are in Burundi cannot even uh, it, it, many of you are on social media cannot even like that fact. They can't even acknowledge that they have seen that because they know that they will pers personally uh, become accountable. So we have created a, a criminal. Um, dictatorship and uh, which is now in the process of, of institutionalizing its, it, itself as, as a dictatorship because now we have our head of state who is uh, getting ready to change our constitution. Um, he's calling for a referendum to, to change the constitution and to abolish the five year uh, presidential terms to turn them to seven years and uh, two consecutive terms for seven years, which means he'll be able to run, in 2020, he'll be able to run for another 14 years, and he'll be there until 2034. And that campaign is being, is currently happening. The referendum is due for uh, the month of May this year, and the campaign happens in such terrorizing ways. Um, a gentleman who said publicly about two weeks ago that he would not vote for, for, for that uh, constitution change has since been, has died this weekend. He was tortured, uh, he was thrown in jail, and he just passed away this weekend from, from the injuries that he, he received in torture. This is the state that we are in today. And so in this context, um, um, I think, uh, Professor Cotter, you said something about, uh, you said that these are heroes of, of human rights. I would like to disagree. I don't think we are heroes. I think what we are doing is our basic duty. I think to stand up against uh, such, uh, such horrendous injustices in our communities doesn't, is not heroism. It is basic, it, our, it is our, our, our duty. And I think we need to begin not to, to, to begin to normalize dissent and to normalize these acts of, of uh, rebellion against authoritarianism. Because we have, today we are in a context of global, a global rise of uh, authoritarianism and dictatorship. 
It's a trend that I see uh, worldwide through the work that I do at Nobel Women's Initiative. And it almost seems coordinated. And I think it's critical for us, and I hope we address that uh, today, it's critical for us who believe in justice, who believe in the powerful role that women play in, uh, in turning our countries right. It, it is imperative that we, um, that, that, that we unite and work and look at this globally and work uh, together to create a global movement for human rights. And that's the only way we're going to curb this. If we continue to look at it only from our country's perspective, um, we will not be able to redress um, what is happening today. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll end really by, by saying that we need to absolutely normalize this and, and, and not look at us as, um, as exceptional. Because the more you make actions like I'm sure the other very incredible women who are here today, the more we make them exceptional, the, the more we make injustice normal. So um, it, it is, it, it's really, really, I think, the call that I would leave us with to um, encourage to lead, to encourage the fight for human rights to become mainstream, to become uh, a focus for regular individuals and civilians, and not just those of us who work in um, organizations for, for human rights, but really the fight that anyone uh, can take. And I, I really am the proof that you can do it. It just takes that determination and any one of us can, um, can do that and bring that change. So I'll, I'll, I'll end here for now and I look forward to your questions and, uh, and comments and ideas of how we can globally move forward and, uh, and advance uh, our common struggle. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. I, I think you characterized it best. We are in the presence of a resurgent global authoritarianism. And that, along with an illiberal populism and weaponization of information and the like, and that requires a global justice movement and a <clears throat> democratic renewal in order to address that uh, injustice. You're right about normalizing what I characterize as acts of heroism. But I don't think it detracts from the fact that those who've been standing up in the face of such mass uh, oppression demonstrated a singular heroism nonetheless. But I take your point and well taken about normalizing this as a larger democracy movement to address this resurgent global authoritarianism. Our second speaker today is one of the people who's leading uh, the struggle with respect to what is happening with the pain and plight of the Rohingya. I'm speaking of Weiwei Nu, who herself was a political prisoner uh, for seven years, managed at the same time to develop uh, two NGOs, a women's peace network, a women's justice uh, NGO, receive a law degree, emerge as one of the leading voices with respect to the struggle for peace and human rights, uh, recently characterized by uh, Time magazine as one of the 50 leading uh, leaders, human rights leaders in the world today. And so I'm delighted to have Wei Wei Nu share her experience and uh, her vision with you. Wei Wei. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Professor Kotler, for your very nice introductions. And thanks for giving me th this opportunity to be here and to share a little bit of my perspective. And thanks, my friend Bren uh, Brendan, for inviting me here. And thanks to all organizers. First of all, I think the, this um, venue and the women here and the people who gather here, it's a phenomenal for me. It's such an uh, inspirational. Allow me to say congratulations to all the women here in this room and all the women who are uh, working and fighting for the social injustice and for women's rights. And a congratulations and thank you to you all. 
and you are all of you are really you know really mean a lot to me really like all of your presence your achievement your actions and your passions actually built me who I am today. It's not just me who I was in the prison or who a little girl in, 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 in like a very remote uh, village of Burma, you know, in Burma, in repressed, under the repressive regime who could be here. It's in fact, it's all also about the by seeing all other inspirational women in, around us and around the world and all of their achievement today. So I heartfelt, you know, congratulate all of you and thank you. And um, <coughs> as a woman, in fact, it's not really easy when the society is so repressive. And uh, while the communities are so closed, coming from a background in Burma, you know, like in under the repressive regime for six decades, it was not easy. Although we have a women leader in the leadership role, but a lot of the women, majority of the women from diverse community, it's not really easy to come uh, up and to stand up for social justice, social justice, and to fight for gender equality, to fight for women's rights, to fight for human rights, or even to fight for their own dignity and existence. It's not really easy. It was too challenging for me to, when I came out from the jail in 2012, after seven years of imprisonment, I was still quite young. And it was not even easy to start talking about the issues. And it was not even easy to even organize an organization just because I am a woman and I am double, I am a young woman and I, I, and I am from a minority community. Yet I think it is very important for all of us to speak up against uh, social injustice, the repressions and the inequality and all of the you know, challenges that we face in, the, in our society. And I thought, if I don't speak up, who else will say? Who else would speak up? And I have to, I have obligation to speak up. And, and that's where I started with having little venue and opportunities. I thought I will be doing it. And I started it, but then, as I said, all other women leaders, leading women around the world, give me a lot of energy and courage to be confident to really able to continue. However, I can see, I mean, it is amazing that, you know, the discussions around the women, around women rights, gender equality is enriching today, including the movement like Me, me Too, Time's Up, and even, um, and speaking many, speaking, I mean, um, speaking by the many celebrities, leaders around the world, it's, it's amazing. And I, I have seen that a lot of women, celebrities, men, talking about this. And also I have seen like people, in the UN, like including Secretary General, has been talking about the gender equality and women's rights. And it is amazing. And I have two perspectives on this. Firstly, I think this discussion has to go beyond this, um, uh, the top level, uh, like, um, uh, discussions. Yeah, um, it has to go beyond UN. It has to. It has to go beyond the United States to all other corner of the world. It has to go beyond the uh, Hollywood. You know, it has to be actually. Um, uh, you know, actually. You know, uh, and I mean, as uh, how do we say? Really uh, built up these discussions in a strong way on, in the grassroots and um, to all over, the co uh, all over the world, including most affected, conflict-affected areas. And uh, tension has to go there. And, and there are sometimes uh, you know, women in the grassroots who have been struggling for their rights, for, di for their dignity, and for, their, uh, you know, for the suffering that they have been suffering. But then the attention is not going there too. So there is two, two, two ways to look into. One way is how can we really bring you know, this attention, discussions to the, uh, you know, to the places where we really need 
more attention, where we really need the suffering is the most. And also, how do we celebrate, or how do we encourage, or how do we really uh, support you know, women who are struggling in the ground? So this is one perspective that I, I want to bring into all of your uh, thought you know, when it's come to the women's rights discussions, gender equality discussions around the world. And secondly, um, you know, how, I mean, uh, how do we actually um, the the when we talk about this you know the gender equality and it is easy for like people like uh, secretary general people like Angelina Jolie talking about this stuff right uh, they will not face any reprisal basically but when people like us or people women in the ground speak up about the injustice if, if they speak up about the women's rights you know they face enormous challenges reprisal threat. And how do we really, how do we really overcome with that? How do we really support them? How do we protect them? So I don't see that there are like you know strong mechanism to really provide, uh, give protections to the women human rights defenders or female human rights defenders or even women who, in the grassroots, who is who is um, who are empowered basically and you know helping their own community you know this, despite of titles there aren't there aren't enough. Just last last year in in Burma, there is a women human rights defenders in in a corner of the country. Her name is No Chit Pan Dine, and she is very young. She is around twenties, and she was fighting for like environmental rights because of the investment development projects in the country. The uh, the environment has been affecting, and the community has been affecting. Women has been losing the land, so she was fighting for that. And one day she was killed last year, and we don't know what happened to them. Oh, to, what 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 really happened to her? So. So how do we really protect these kind of women? Why, how, how can, why can we bring justice for these women? We don't know what is the reason of her death. Yes, he was shot dead. Uh, he, he was killed on a, on in a concert. So, so you know, it is very important that we have um, very, uh, you know, beyond the uh, discussions, in, you know, in the top level, but also really come up with a strong strategy and practical um, uh, actions plan to really protect women in the grounds. And just last week, again, you know, uh, you know, when you talk about, you know. I mean, Burma today is the, the hardest time we're facing today. My community has been facing, as uh, you know, UN High Commissioner has mentioned, is the act of genocide or the, 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 its amount to the crimes against humanity in Burma, my community, the Rohingya. But then beyond that, the all many other uh, ethnic groups in the countries are also also facing uh, I mean similar atrocities in their own uh, respective uh, uh, you know conflict uh, uh, context. And at the same times, the freedom at, has been um, kind of um, uh, how do we say the freedom has been more and more or the 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 more and more like restricted and the human rights deter uh, human rights uh, violation has been increasing and it has been human rights has been deteriorating overall in generally and there is no the the freedom of expression and freedom of speech has been highly threatened and many people who have been speaking up against the injustice against the atrocity crimes as against the ethnic cleansing have been highly targeted and just last last month, uh, uh, um, a senior human rights women human rights activist and you know democratic activist from Burma, who joined with Nobel Women Initiative to Bangladesh to see the refugee, and she is actually a Burmese uh, Burmese uh, Buddhist uh, 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 Burmese uh, like uh, women, and she visited to the to the. Uh, Bangladesh came to see their refugee, to met with the refugee women, and you know, as as a women, female, uh, you know, human rights defender, she showed her sympathy and her support to the Rohingya women, fellow Rohingya women, as she see them as equal people as as her. Um, and and the the actually what happened was consequently, you know. One of the video that she was speaking to the Rohingya women uh, was uh, po uh, put up on the social media, 
and it has been like uh, the video has been used against her to humiliate um, you know her actions and her it itself by many way including sexual harassment death threats and 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 beyond that actually so it's it's been so women what I'm trying to say is women who try to challenge the system who try to challenge um, you know the social injustice and who try to uh, walk you know fight against their rights and dignity have, could face enormous challenges in the community based on the context that they come from and it could translate it to the social media today to be social media become a very easy platform for many people to humiliate women and women who are in power or human who, women who uh, female human rights defenders and beyond that you know the most of the time we are seeing country like us the female human rights defenders are actually being uh, not only targeted by the people in the community on the social media, but also they could be targeted by the uh, authorities. So in her case, her discussion, her video was taken actually to the parliament, democratic, so-called democratic parliament. And the, 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 by using that video, uh, the, the MP, actually MPs in the parliament discussed how the uh, state, how the government is going to take actions against these women who is showing sympathy to the uh, refugee. So, you know, it is very, very easy and uh, easy to target women human rights defenders just because who they are, just because they are seen as weak in our society, just because of their identity. And they can be criminalized in many ways. And so, my final, you know, uh, request and, and my thought here to you is while we are talking about the gender equality in the top level, while we are talking about the women's rights and how we can bring up uh, that discussion to the ground and how we can create a, an effective mechanism and practical actions to the grassroots level to really protect you know, women human rights defenders. Thank you. Thank you, Wei Wei Nu, for your impassioned remarks. And you put a crucial challenge to us. How do we build a grassroots movement? How do we protect the women's human rights defenders? You know, as I look around uh, the room here today, I'm delighted when I see such a large assemblage, maybe 90% of the audience, you know, uh, are women. But then I have to ask myself, where are the men? Because if we want to build that critical mass, that grassroots movement that you mentioned, and protect women's rights, we need men and women working together in common cause. And I have to tell you that <laughs> when I was a, a member of parliament in Canada, one of the first, uh, I won't go into how it happened, but I uh, became a member of the Women's Caucus shortly after I became an elected member of parliament. And for the next 15 years as a member of parliament, I was the only member of the Women's Caucus. And I mentioned this because it was a weekly meeting, and the most compelling meeting of the week I had as a parliamentarian was the Women's Caucus meeting, because we discussed real issues. We discussed issues of health. We discussed issues of environment. We discussed issues of childcare, discussed issues of social justice, we discussed issues of the human condition internationally. And it was not a divisive, polarized politics, but it was working together in common cause for the human welfare. So I hope we will <laughs> we'll see more uh, men who are involved, not as perpetrators of violence, but as defenders and protectors of women human rights defenders in common cause. We're now going to have a, a video. Uh, Maria Corina Machado, our next uh, speaker, is in uh, Venezuela. Uh, she is a member of the Venezuelan uh, parliament, uh, one of the great leaders of the uh, democratic opposition uh, in uh, Venezuela. Uh, she, I had the pleasure of hosting her in the Canadian uh, parliament some 10 years ago, but she is no longer permitted uh, to leave uh, Venezuela, uh, no freedom of, of movement but her voice is still being uh, heard and 
I just want to mention, closing on this, that recently the Organization of American States, the OAS, established a, an international uh, legal panel, which I'm very pleased to be part of it, a three-person panel, to look into the question of whether crimes against humanity are being committed in Venezuela, and if so, to refer the matter to the International uh, Criminal Court. We will be reporting at the beginning sometime in April uh, with respect to our report. We've been involved in this now in terms of evidence gathering, fact finding, legal analysis and the like, and we will be producing our report, as I say, uh, sometime uh, in April. But now you will hear uh, the voice of someone who has been at the forefront of that struggle for human rights in Venezuela, Maria Cunha Machado. Hello, my name is Maria Corina Machado and I'm talking to you from Caracas, Venezuela. I want to thank the Center for Human Rights, Raoul Wallenberg, and its chairman, Professor Irving Cutler, for this great opportunity and for the honor to share this time with three wonderful women. Wai Wainu from Myanmar, uh, Masgas Askami from Iran, and Keti Nivyavani from Burundi. Uh, we all come from very distant regions, but certainly we share values, dreams, aspirations, and, and determination for making our countries different and live prosperous and free nations for our kids and generations to come. I, I would have loved to be with you today, but uh, I have been banned from the regime to leave my country for the last four years. Actually, I'm not even allowed to take a, a private plane, private flight within Venezuela. So uh, this is a great opportunity to convey to you what we Venezuelans are living right now and certainly what we are determined to do, especially women. Um, during the last 18 years, we Venezuelans have been fighting against a very powerful and a, on a scru unscrupulous regime. And we've done that barely on our own. Finally, the international community has understand the nature of this regime and the way it has intentionally uh, advanced in, in three dimensions. On one hand, the way uh, human rights have been violated in a systematic and intentional way. On the second hand, how this uh, human catastrophe has been intentionally created and, and, the, and the cost and damage it has been doing for a whole generation. And on the third hand, and the third side, the way uh, a criminal state has been developed and the links it has established with uh, mafia and criminal networks around the world, from drug cartels to guerrilla, even to uh, extremist terrorist groups from far away. In this sense, I would like to address how uh, the, the, the conditions uh, regarding human rights have been deteriorating uh, to, uh, to a level that is, from a moral perspective, unbearable. Uh, and, and I will address what's going on regarding um, the, the economic and social uh, state and the humanitarian crisis. Secondly, how violence is being used as a as, um, policy, state policy, and third, how uh, the civic and political rights uh, are, have been underscored in our country. I would first like to address the humanitarian side of this crisis. Recently, a, a survey made by the three most best known universities in our country came up with uh, results that, that shook our, our conscience and, 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 and public opinion as well. It's the NCOBI survey for 2017. And these are some of the informations it, it came out with. 87% of the Venezuelan people are poor. And of this total, 61% live in extreme poverty. Last year, 64% of Venezuelan population 
lost on average 23 pounds because of hunger. In order to, to buy food for a whole family, you need 93 minimum wages. And women, on average, need to spend between 8 and 14 hours in line a week in order to buy food for their family. Caritas Venezuela is an NGO that works very close with the Catholic Church. They as well have, uh, have carried out exhausting monitoring of acute malnutrition in our country. Uh, and this is some of their, their findings. 33% of the ch uh, child population have already uh, some degree of growth retardation. Four out of ten children did not grow properly due, due to malnutrition. Fifteen out of every 100 children in poverty are in severe malnutrition. And they have stated that uh, over 280,000 kids could actually die of malnutrition during this year. Regarding uh, sexual reproductive rights, shortages uh, of contraceptive uh, medicines have reached over 90% in 2016, according to the Pharmaceutical Federation. And uh, to, in the report State of World Population to 2017, published by the United Nations Population Fund, Venezuela has the second highest teenage pregnancy rate in the whole region, reaching 95 uh, of one, for every 1,000 girls between 15 and 19 years old. Finally, in, in regarding the humanitarian crisis, I have to address the disease and diseases and lack of medicines. According to the Venezuelan Federation of Pharmacies, since 1915, the shortages of medicine are above 80%. And uh, it is an estimated that in Venezuela there are over 130,000 people living with HIV. Uh, 37,000 of them are women. And uh, according to the non-governmental organization Mujeres Unidas por la Salud, the, more, the, the most recent figures are unknown because the authorities have not published formal and official information. Cancer patients do not escape from this crisis. Uh, for the year 2013, breast cancer in Venezuela has, the first, has been the first cause of death in women. Uh, on the other hand is uh, the, the situation of violence in, in Venezuelan society. Secondly, regarding violence, uh, Venezuela has turned out to be the most violent country in the world, according to Inside Crime, an NGO that has ranked our country in that level, uh, with an average of 89 murders per uh, every 100,000 inhabitants last year. And to this, uh, and due to the, to the weakness of, of the institutions and the fact that the regime has used violence as a way to isolate and divide population. On the other hand, we are seeing that this uh, common crime is accompanied by political crime and political violence. Last year, at least 137 Venezuelans were killed in protests. Nine of those were women. And uh, finally, I, I'd like to address the situation uh, regarding to civic and political rights. First, freedom of speech. Severe restrictions to the right of freedom of speech has been taking place in Venezuela through censorship, the persecution of journalists, closing of politica, uh, of media outlets, and, and so on. According to the National Union of Workers of the Press in Venezuela, 498 events um, uh, constituted violations of the freedom of speech during last year. Uh, likewise, 49 audiovisual media were closed, ordered by the, the regime, mostly radio stations. 
and uh, during last year as well, several international media were blocked uh, from transmitting from Venezuela, among them RCN, Caracol, and CNN in Espanol. On the other hand, regarding private property, uh, property rights in Venezuela were violated at least 11,800 times during 2017. It, it made one of the worst years so far since uh, the regime uh, came to power eight years ago. These, these numbers were tracked and, and measured and recorded by the Observatory of Property Rights as well as the NGO Cedice Libertad. Um, among these, I, I'd like to mention uh, 1,300 looting uh, events in commercial premises, which according to the ODP actually took place with the consent of the regime. And, uh, and finally, I'd like to address an issue that is very close to, to my heart and my time, and, and, and that is the situation of political prisoners in Venezuela. Uh, according to the El Foro Penal, an NGO that gives um, assistance to, to all people persecuted in our country, since 2014, 1,330 Venezuelans have been put in jail. Uh, uh, for political reasons. Out of those, 235 are still in prison, uh, in prisons that are, that are inhuman, where torture takes places, take place, and where the, their rights uh, are every day uh, violated. Uh, I'd like to mention specifically the, the, uh, the fact that, as we know so far, there are eight Venezuelans, uh, young Venezuelans, uh, beyond um, underage, that are, uh, we just find out these last days and hours that, have sp that are in prison in a political uh, jail called El Helicoide, uh, and for months some of them have not even had the right to see their moms or lawyers. This was a situation that was not known, and these kids are in a horrible situation of, with malnutrition and torture, and they are being detained among all the prisoners. This is the situation of Venezuela at present. From a human's perspective, it is unbearable. From an ethical perspective, it is unacceptable. For almost two decades, we Venezuelans have been fighting alone against a criminal state that has link and support from criminal groups around the world. Finally, the international community has moved from indifference to action. We do have a window of opportunity to stop this tragedy, and we must do so. International pressure is working. The regime is cracking. It is certainly the most dangerous and obscure moment in our history. But we, and I do trust the strength of the Venezuelan people with women in the first line, as international community such as you, elevating and sharing our views and determination to save our country. When women get together, the whole society listens and we can make the world follow us. We need you today more than ever, and I have trust and confidence that soon we will see Venezuela as a prosperous, free, democratic, and just nation again. And we will have learned from these horrible sacrifices and experiences on what to do so that never again a tyranny puts its boot, its legs, and it's forced in our country. Thank you very much. You saw and heard a graphic testimony of the situation uh, in Venezuela from the criminalization of fundamental freedoms to political prisoners to torture and detention, but the emphasis on an issue that is not always appreciated, and that is the humanitarian catastrophe today in Venezuela. The state orchestrated 
humanitarian catastrophe. A dramatic rise in infant mortality. A dramatic rise in maternal mortality. Dramatic rises in malnutrition and the like. And the refusal of the government to even accept and thereby even rejecting the humanitarian assistance that is offered. But as Marina Corina Machado concluded, the international community has moved from indifference to action. And that that action at this point may presage the beginnings of the democratization of Venezuela and its return to being a free and democratic country. It's my pleasure now to introduce to you Rafaz Afkani, who is a leading voice with respect for women's rights, equality, uh, human rights in Iran. She is the founder and head of the Women's Learning a partnership. She is the head of the Foundation for Iranian Studies, a leading scholar, educator, teacher, activist. She became the first minister for women's affairs in Iran from 1976 to 1978. Indeed, the first Muslim in the world to hold such a position. And in the course of being in that position, also initiated and saw enacted progressive family uh, legislation uh, in Iran. Her scholarship has had worldwide resonance. It's been translated into more than 20 uh, languages. And so we are in the presence, as I say, of a leading scholar, educator, activist, government minister, and international voice for women's rights and human rights. And it's, uh, I think, fortuitous, but happily coming here uh, today on the occasion of the Iranian uh, New Year, which is being celebrated today. So, Manas. Well, I'm totally humbled by that introduction. Uh, so, uh, may I say something light, uh, because we've been bearing the uh, woes and sorrows of, of all of us across four continents. Uh, so, if you don't mind, I'll just start with something light. And that is when, as Erin uh, mentioned, I was uh, appointed Minister for Women's Affairs in Iran. This was the end of the International Women's Year, and uh, we'd had a really fantastic year of celebration and work. And Francois Giroux of, George, uh, of uh, France, who had been the first minister of women in the world, had been there and had set an example. So I was appointed th to this post. At that time, nobody knew what a minister for women's affairs was supposed to do. So I went to uh, England on my first trip, and I was introduced to Princess Margaret. And she said, my dear, how do you manage women's affairs? <laughs> and uh, it's been something I've been trying to manage for nearly 40 years with not much success, I'm afraid. But anyway, this was just something uh, light to, to, uh, to bring us to, to the moment of the new year in Iran, uh, which is going to be in, uh, you know, it starts at the exact moment of the equinox, and uh, so to the minute. And so the celebration is of the coming of spring and uh, energy and rebirth and hope and so forth. Uh, so I'll remind you when the time comes and we all have to at least clap, you know, <laughs> and, and look to the future. Uh, my friends uh, on the panel have uh, given moving and really uh, extraordinary stories of the struggle around the world, and we are all uh, really involved in it. Uh, I have uh, a lot of uh, uh, tragedy, uh, as m most who have spoken have had, and I have been out of uh, the country uh, uh, for, for uh, the entire uh, time of the revolution, charged with corruption on earth and warring with God. 
And uh, it's uh, uh, a charge that I have uh, not been actually tried for. I don't know how they were going to present <laughs> uh, any kind of um, uh, testimony or, 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 or proof. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, um, uh, the only other woman who was in the Iranian cabinet, who was a minister of education, happened to be in Iran at the time of the revolution and thinking innocently that since she's done such a great work, you know, a, a physician and then an educator and then minister of education, what did she have to fear? And they actually executed her uh, for, uh, again, the same charge, corruption on earth and warring with God. And they actually hung her in the red light district with a prostitute and a drug addict and uh, I was in, in the United States, in New York, actually negotiating a contract with the United Nations to set up the INSTRA, the International Institute for Research and Training of Women. And it took, as the UN, we all know, take, took a little longer than we had uh, anticipated. Instead of two weeks, I was here for a month, and they told me not to come back because the revolution has happened. So I live uh, in, uh, in addition to my own uh, family's sorrows and, and, and uh, tragedies, I live with the guilt feeling that if I had been there, the evil minister of women's affairs, perhaps they would have left my colleague, uh, allowed her to live. They had to kill a woman, you know. And uh, so, um, you know, many of us happen to have that uh, issue of exile. Everyone here who speaks has been in, is in exile, and, and uh, our colleague uh, from Venezuela is on in internal exile. And that is a condition of our time which is very traumatic, uh, in addition to the physical and, and, and uh, all of the economic issues that one faces. There is a huge uh, issue of lo loss of identity that never and never really uh, goes away. Uh, you always feel like a jar that has been broken, as one of the people that I uh, told the story of in a book I did, uh, Women in Exile, you know, she was saying that we're like, uh, like some uh, fragile China that has been broken, and even if you put it together, it's never the same. Uh, so that, unfortunately, is the situation. And if things don't go well in this country uh, in the next uh, few months after the 2018 uh, the elections, I think you can expect us in Canada, I tell you, because <laughs> we have to stand in line, I'm sure, but another, another uh, uh, you know, trip will be required. Uh, so um, anyway, I want to actually address not the horrific situation in Iran, which is really um, as bad and has many of the uh, characteristics that you have heard in other places. But I, th I think we don't have that much time, and it would be wonderful to hear, uh, I'm sure, from Denise and also from um, uh, some of you who might have uh, queries or comments. So I'll just uh, talk about uh, possibly potential solutions. We had uh, conversations and mention of the fact of how important it is to reach the grassroots. We talked about the global nature of what we uh, suffer. We talked about the normalization of, of uh, certain practices uh, in, in countries who uh, actually come to represent all the highest values uh, that we hold dear, uh, countries that don't even, you know, I, I mean, I don't, I don't see why I can't, I'm an NGO, <laughs> why I can't mention names, but let's say Saudi Arabia, who has uh, no constitution, no one votes, there is no legislation, uh, and uh, let alone women, the men, uh, and, and uh, you know, represents uh, uh, the highest values of the United Nations. Uh, on, on entities that are so instrumental. Iran, on the other hand, enemies, the two enemies, Iran, uh, it's the same, you know. We had a serious constitutional revolution as early as 1907, and it was a decent uh, constitution with parliamentary uh, representation and, and uh, uh, a secular justice system and so forth. Of course, there were uh, flaws and there were issues with the Constitution, uh, some of it having to do with civic learning and civic organizing, 
some of it having to do with history, change has to come, culture has to change, people have to be able to engage in sensible, uh, rational, participatory ways. But we were really pretty uh, far ahead. But we have now a constitution that has the one supreme leader who actually represents not only civic government, but God himself, you know. And uh, how are you gonna fight with that, you know? Uh, and, and especially since people, you know, have faith and believe and, and, and uh, think that perhaps there is a, a point to that. Uh, so uh, there is that kind of thing today that perhaps we haven't experienced in the same way previously, that is the use of religion, and I think we had uh, mention uh, of, of, of the uh, use of ethnicity, use of all possible things that in themselves could be celebratory, uh, the use of uh, differences that we all have in, in our cultures and so forth in order to divide and to nationalism, can, which can be something that is pride in your country, turning it into something that divides us and, 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 and uh, uh, separates us. So what, what, uh, what I uh, will quickly tell you about is the way that the organizations that I've had the uh, honor and the pleasure of working with for the last uh, two and a half decades have experienced um, uh, the queries, experienced uh, the uh, contact with, cha and with the challenges and confrontation with the challenges and the solutions they have come up with. It's been a process, it's been a long process. The core uh, group is 20 organizations that are in, uh, on four continents. Uh, they're uh, established grassroots organizations. We meet together uh, once a year for about a week to, to look at the challenges and also the possibilities. We would not be capable of doing this unless uh, we had the technology that we, know, we now have. We're in constant daily dialogue, okay? So what have we come to? Just to sum it up, we've come to the conclusion that the women's movement has to be global. It, 50% of the population <coughs> encompasses all the other identities that we have splintered into and fight for. We are the disabled. We are all rainbow of colors. We are all the nationalities. We are all the religions. So we do encompass all of that. And all of us, no matter where we live, how different we look, how we dress, how uh, uh, developed or underdeveloped we are, uh, the, the way that we our life is structured the same in any country, whether it be China or the United States or, or uh, uh, New Zealand. The family is more or less structured the same. Some are beginning to change, but basically it's structured the same. The man on top and then uh, various levels of other males. That structure is hierarchical, top down, and decision making is not participatory and women are more or less confined to the private sphere and men to the public sphere. This is something that is not uh, created that way because some mean men decided they're gonna abuse the women. It was structured that way because it was necessary. Not very long ago, people lived about 40 years. Women were pregnant or breastfeeding most of their lives. They had 10 kids, most of them died, and, and, and they needed kids to take care of them when they were old and also to economically help them in the rural settings that most people live. Things have changed since the 19th century especially. We now have birth control. We now have longer lifespans. We now live in cities. We now have industries where you work, but we don't need physical strength. So now we really have no excuse for keeping that particular structure. The other problem is that we as women have been products of the same structure and we have passed it on to our children. We are the ones who say little girls have to cross their legs, be nice, uh, keep a low voice and whatever. We are the ones who tell the boys you have to 
you have to have fight and you have to be courageous and boys don't cry. We are the ones who pass on that culture and even create that culture in places where they have FGM, for instance, which is a horrendous practice. Unless women and aunts and, and the cousin, the female cousins celebrated this, unless they actually made it a ceremony of, of uh, ad uh, adulthood, it, it wouldn't happen. And women are, I'm not saying women are guilty, women are participants because there had been no other way. This had been the way to, to, to function. So now I think that we see that this structure is replicated in the educational system, the teacher talks, the others take notes, in, in community organizations, in politics, in economics. We have to change it at the base, the architecture of human relationships is what we call it. And so to do that, we need the other half of the population, as Erwin was saying. We need to come together with a new vision, a new way of looking at the world. Now in the 20th century, we have all the power of science to heal diseases, to not let them spread. We can control our environment. We can feed everybody. We can shelter everybody. There is no excuse for it. And in order to do it, we simply have to work together, not fo focusing on our differences, which are, some of them are great. They're like our New Year. They're celebratory, wonderful things, like the way we dress. My shirt is from Morocco, I love it. But it's not these traditions and cultural and uh, what we eat, which is fantastic, the variety that one sees in New York. Those are beautiful and contextual, literary, mythology, religious practices. We have to adapt to those. So universal rights for everybody, the way we figured it out uh, in uh, the 1940s, contextualized and culturally adapted to each setting and working together with men to change things according to a vision which is inclusive, which is participatory, and which is respectful of all rights. So we have already started that. Guys and girls, you got to come on, help us, and we got to get the message to other people, and we have to sit together and stop this madness. Uh, otherwise, uh, we're going to have tales of suffering forever, and uh, heaven knows what else, you know, in terms of destruction of the planet and in terms of destruction of, of all that is good in our lives. So uh, I hope that, uh, I'm just checking to see if it's time to celebrate the new year. What, does everybody have what time it is? We're supposed to celebrate at 12.15. Huh, can we do it a little early? <laughs> <Because> <laughs> so let us say, happy no rules. It's going to be a great year for all of us. <laughs> And we're going to be part of this new vision and, and make it happen by next year this time, we'll be on our way. Thank you so much. Vena, thank you for sharing with us that inclusive uh, participatory message and vision of uh, universal human rights where we can all uh, engage in common cause towards that objective and doing so at this celebratory moment of the Iranian uh, New Year. It's my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, to you uh, Denise uh, Robinson, who's joined us on this uh, panel. Uh, she is a member of parliament for the Opposition Democratic Alliance in South Africa, a, a shadow uh, women's uh, minister, very engaged in issues of women's rights, and I'll turn it over to Denise. And, Shortly after that, we will open it up uh, for some questions in the brief time we have left. Denise. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It is indeed an honor and a privilege for me to be here today, joining this illustrious panel. I must tell you that I have been inspired and I have been emboldened, and I'm also thankful that in many ways in South Africa, our situation is not as bad as it is in your countries. However, one has to be careful that one keeps a watch on constitutionalism and on liberalism, 
because in Africa in particular, it has been so obvious that freedom fighters, movements that have come to overthrow an oppressive system very often become oppressive themselves. So I must say that I'm really glad to be able to represent the international liberal movement as well, and especially the women's movement of the ILN. So right, now South Africa, women have played a major role in the political development in South Africa throughout the struggle, which many of you will know about. However, it has always been in a subservient role, in a backup situation. It has not been for leadership, except in the modern day. But let me go back. 1956 was a very important time in South Africa because that was when women of all races, creeds, colors stood together and marched to the United um, to the Union buildings in Pretoria, which was the seat of government at that stage. And they said, we will not carry the Dompas, which was a, a document which all African males had had to carry, and then women as well. And that was a great uniting moment, that it was people of all races, and many women stood up and also suffered. I won't go into all the difficulties that we had in the 50s and the 60s. There were great liberal women like Helen Sussman, who was the founder, well, one of, well, she was my role model from the time I was six years old, but she was part of the Democratic Party, uh, broke away, but again, I won't go into the details. But she was the lone woman in parliament, in that sea of nationalist parliamentarians, the apartheid government. But she was brave. She was courageous. She was somebody who reached out and asked the most difficult questions and challenged the, um, the apartheid government. She was the one who visited the island, Robben Island, and saw Nelson Mandela and all the others. But women have been at the bottom of the pile, except for our Helen Sussman, and then um, um, also Winnie Mandela. I see I've only got one minute. I thought I had 10. <laughs> anyway, I'll have to be very quick. Now, let me just say, we have many women in parliament now um, from opposition and ruling party, but um, not 50-50 yet. This is a struggle. But what are the struggles that we have in South Africa? Women are subject to patriarchal system. And we have major problems like um, rape, abuse, domestic violence. And the problem is, that the instruments of law, the instruments of due process are not standing up for this. Our justice system is flawed. The policing system is very flawed. And women who come there beaten and up and so on are often just sent away and said, go away, come back on Monday. And there's like a conspiracy of silence amongst the police and the ordinary citizens who just say, women, are second-class citizens. They deserve to be beaten. Um, if they, sh if they, they are raped, it's probably because their skirts are too short. So I can go into that in great depth, but I don't have the time. We also have problems with LGBTI rates. Women... I'll cut down on discussion a bit if you want to Okay, go sure. Um, there is sexual violence against lesbians, uh, corrective rape is something which takes place where men have got the right or they feel they have the right to rape and beat women into submission to make them normal in their terms. Um, so there are many murders and there are many things that happen that we have to fight against and speak up about. Now I'm able to speak up about this in Parliament and I certainly do. 
I have also started an organization called the Democratic Alliance Women's Network. It's the acronym DAWN. And that is significant too, because it means the light after the darkness of the night and the darkness of ignorance and of prejudice. And we're an organization that helps women to know what democracy is really about, that it's not just voting once every five years. I want to tell you too that human trafficking is rife um, within the country and also from uh, our borders. And one of the reasons for this is the extreme poverty that many women have, um, not only in the deep rural areas, and it is extreme, and this is why you have urbanization, people coming to the cities, but we have to find economic improvements so that women can be independent and can know the true fruits of justice and of freedom. So we have a good constitution. The Democratic Party with people like um, Colin um, Eglin, uh, Dean Smuts and others played a really important role when we got, came to freedom. But the problem is that the laws are not implemented. They are not properly costed. So for somebody like me in the opposition and the rest of my team, we have to make sure that there are checks and balances. I'm afraid gender budgeting is something which is there in name only. And we find that the, pre the predominance of the funding from budgeting goes to things like education, science, energy, mining. Good things, education and science and all those things, but it's not effective. So we have to make sure that there is enough money for education and for giving girls the opportunity to know that they are not second-class citizens, that they can reach for the stars. And as you said, we all need to band together and we can make a difference because the mother is at the heart of every family and she's the one who can influence her family. And we as mothers also need to teach our sons that the patriarchal system is not right, that love, humanity and respect can win so much more than controlling authoritarianism. Thank you. I want to thank you, uh, Denise, the particular mention of Helen Sussman. Uh, she actually hosted me on my first uh, trip to South Africa as a guest of the anti-apartheid movement at that time, some 40 years ago, and engaged me then in the defense of Nelson Mandela. So thank you for that remembrance. We have a very few moments because we have to vacate the room. I'll open it up. I see right. Yeah. For me, it's not a question, it's basically a comment. Um, as someone who is HIV, uh, the question comes in all different forms. Sometimes it's not state sponsored, it's the lack of understanding, the lack of uh, the isolation, the alienation for people with HIV are very, uh, all around the world, it's probably quite severe. And it's time perhaps for people from this room here to look into their heart and to see how do they treat people of HIV. How do you treat people of mental illness? Because while I'm HIV, I care for several members of my family who are mentally ill. And I sense the prejudice, even around family members, close family members. They isolate you, they alienate you, or people keep, keep you aside, they ignore you. And I'm begging the United Nations Watch and people in here to basically look inside your heart and make a decision to help us. Thank you for that and that reminder right, right straight ahead of me. Yes. If you'd like, maybe you, may, you might want to come up, you might be heard. But as I say, I have to just counsel you because we've got to, uh, people are waiting for the room and we're obliged to vacate. So I'll ask you if you can, please make it brief. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank the panelists for what, uh, as I said, uh, uh, I think uh, I am uh, working in our organization in conflict areas in Sudan. Uh, as you know, or as you said, the situation, the grassroots is made a lot, you see? But sometimes I think that, uh, or do you agree with me that, we are suffered that women are not knowing their rights. We are suffered to convince women to know their rights. 
this is a difficult subject also we need awareness but the awareness is there is no media no access to net in these areas and so this is need raising awareness through uh, some uh, lectures and so this need support this need, this need the financial support also uh, sometimes uh, you find in the community the local uh, the local leaders you see are causing uh, some problem or some troubles so do you agree with me that we need political support in order to uh, enclose the gap of women rights thank you Thank you for that intervention. I, I see a lot of hands, but I've only got to go uh, with one more and the sequence in which people raise their hands. So right here, uh, one last one. I'm sorry about that. I see uh, questions, but we, we are obliged to conclude. Erwin, thank you. As you know, I'm one of the founders of the Illinois Holocaust Museum in iconic Skokie, the 2017 Museum of the Year. We have a concept in our museum of being an upstander, not a bystander, a proactive, positive force for change. And I just want to applaud all the women on this panel and also on the video who are these voices that we need to ever strengthen and give power to their causes. Thank you, Rick. And I want to thank all of you for coming here, engaging with us. Uh, sharing your stories, your experiences, your hopes, and your vision. I think it's been a, a great uh, meeting and a special expression of appreciation to our wonderful panelists who are our inspiration. Thank you all. Thank you. How are you? Nice, nice to see you. Good to see you. Thanks. Good to see you here.